And <laughs> yeah, I'm here every day. <laughs> um, so today we don't have the class, uh, the, the last Miudu class, because he has to teach at USP. But we have the privilege of have two of his postdocs here uh, to present part of his research line. And it's a pleasure to introduce you, ladies. <laughs> so I'll introduce both of them. So first, Caroline will talk, and then Erika will talk after, OK? And you will have a break in between uh, the talks that they are presenting. Like five minutes. OK, five minutes, guys. <laughs> so Caroline Marks Draxler da Silva. I don't know how to say your last name. Draxler. That's hard. Uh, so, uh, Caroline um, is a biologist by training with a degree from Universidade Federal do Rio de Janeiro, followed by a master in the same institution and a PhD from the National Natural History Museum of France that I cannot speak in France, <laughs> in French, <laughs> before becoming a postdoc at University of São Paulo at Mildos Lab, Caroline did a postdoc uh, in the University of Amsterdam in the Netherlands. Uh, at her postdoc she, uh, here in Sao Paulo, she's interested in uh, investigating the mechanisms that influence the emergence of mutualisms and antagonisms, and how coevolutionary dynamics influence the evolution of traits in tropical organisms. Okay, so Caroline. And now Erika Marx uh, de Santana, which has the same, one of the same last names, but they are not cousins. <laughs> <laughs> so Erika is also a biologist, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> Everyone, we already know that everyone <laughs> has some kind of relationship with everyone else, right? We had a talk about that. <laughs> so Erika uh, is also a biologist with a bachelor degree from the Universidade Católica de Santos, Unicentos, and a master and PhD degrees from University of São Paulo. And during her PhDs, she also did an internship on, uh, at the University of New South Wales in Australia. Australia, oh, so far. Erika is currently a postdoc at Mildo's lab, and she has a large experience in animal behavior, sexual selection, and inter-individual variation. She worked with Glauco, you already know him as well, and uh, uh, mainly with frogs, right? Yes, yeah. also with crickets. But yeah, also with crickets, yeah. And currently she's more interested in empirical and theoretical questions related to ecological interactions, but a special one that are social interactions between individuals in nature. Um, additionally, uh, Erika also performs works in science outreach. <laughs> I hope you talk about that too. <laughs> okay, great. <laughs> so uh, we will start with Caroline, and then, oh, and I have, oh, sorry guys, I forgot to say this before introducing you. We found this belt. So uh, Caroline, we will start, and yeah. Perfect. And you make questions in the microphone, guys, as usual. Is it working? Yeah. yeah <laughs> Can you hear me well, or should I put it? Yeah. Uh, hi, everyone. Very nice to, to meet uh, all of you. It's a pleasure to be here. I've just heard that. Uh, uh, some of you are not biologists, come from other backgrounds, so I wasn't aware of that. So please, if there is something that I say that it's too much an ecologist uh, talking, you can just raise your arm and then you interrupt me and ask, it's all right, okay? And today I'm going to uh, present a, a part of the work I developed in the, at the University of Amsterdam. And uh, it's um, also what I'm doing now, but uh, I'm now working with another type of interaction. Before I was working with frugivores, so today I'm going to talk about this, this, cons this perspective of uh, looking at mutualisms and antagonisms in a continuum and uh, focusing on plant frugivore interactions. Okay, so uh, when we look at forests like this one, this one is uh, one I worked during my, my PhD. Uh, it's in French Guiana. When you look at this forest, we see, uh, we know that they are very complex and there is uh, a huge diversity of species. And something that we don't see straight uh, uh, away is that uh, there are many species interactions that are uh, structuring these communities. 
And some of these uh, species interactions we can think of uh, frugivory that uh, relates to seed dispersal or seed predation, for example, or herbivory or, or pollination systems. And I'm pretty sure that you heard about all these types of interactions and then that you know that they impact, uh, they affect the plant communities. And, but today, as I said, I'm just going to talk about mainly about frugivory. And this interaction is a very important one because it affects the entire life cycle of plants. And the, because of that, it has a high impact on community structure. And animals, they, they, they consume fruits and then as multiples um, seed fates can follow after this. And they end up uh, influencing uh, plant regeneration and uh, with impacts for colonization of new areas, gen flow, and they end up uh, um, structuring the um, spatial and genetic aspects of plant populations. And this interaction is also interesting because fruit consumption can result both in antagonisms, that uh, interactions in which one species benefit and the other does not, or mutualisms uh, that the, both in, species uh, benefit from the interaction, right? So sometimes this type of this fruit consumption can result in seed predation, in which in, in an interaction where the animal they feed on the seed, and because they feed directly on the seed, they kill the seed, so there is no associated benefits for the plants. But uh, Many times, frugivores, they consume seeds and they increase seed viability and many other aspects of, of, uh, of um, or other plant demographic process. So it's known as a kind of an exchange of food for seed transport and the associated benefits of it. So they're considered mutualistic as well. However, what we know with uh, accumulating evidence on this type of interactions is that most interactions they involve both costs and benefits. There is no such a thing as a, an interaction that is fully mutualistic in every context. So there are context-dependent effects that can influence the outcome. But how can we quantify this variation instead of just looking at uh, mutualisms or antagonisms and quantify the variation of effects of frugivores on plant communities? So this was what I was interested in during this postdoc. And one first step to think about how the, the multiple effects frugivores can have on plants is if you think that first, they do not only affect seed dispersal and seed movement, but they influence many multiple plant demographic processes, such as uh, the, the impact on the seed itself, whether it is viable or not after ingestion, and where they deposit the seeds, and how all these factors will influence seedling, uh, seed germination, seedling emergence, and the, the, the recruitment process of plants. So what I, wh what I did was to incorporate all this variation and the multiple effects on different plant demographic processes to understand the effects of frugivores on communities, and I'm going to talk a bit about this. Another a part of the frugiv frugivory that is important uh, that we um, that we have a, a, a better look at because we, when we talk about frugivory, we are often talking about animals that ingest entire fruits. However, frugivory uh, has multiple modes of uh, feeding interaction. So animals can, just like the toucan here, or they can, they can, they often ingest, uh, uh, consume the entire fruit. So the effects on the seed occur on the, in the gut of the animal or where the, the seed uh, is left afterwards. But some interactions are mainly based on pulp consumption. So animals do not uh, handle the seeds or even ingest them, they just consume pulp. But these interactions are often neglected in, in frugivory studies. And we also have the granivores but that are also frugivores because they feed on fruits, but they ingest mainly the seeds. And this is a differentiation that we need to do to understand the wh where comes variation, where the variation comes from, uh, variation of effects of frugivory. So just to talk about uh, each one of these type of the interactions, uh, as I said, these, these fruit eaters, they ingest entire fruits and disperse seeds 
endosocorically, that means inside the gut, and then they defecate or regurgitate the seeds afterwards. And because many of the, the animals that can ingest entire fruits, they, they are large, they have also large um, range size, so they travel long distance, they're known for being the, the legitimate seed dispersers, the mutualists of the systems. And they affect much of the spatial distribution of plants, and they also have important effects on seed germination. For example, as is shown here, for these Miconia plants, you see that uh, the, the proportion of germination is pretty high for, for mammals or for frugivores uh, that, in, that uh, feed on entire fruits, even though there is a lot of variation as well, as we can see here. And then we have the pulp eaters, those that feed only on the pulp. They often drop the seed right uh, near the fruit source, so they do not, are not considered very uh, important dispersers. And they also they consider as uh, cheaters, so because they have no, they, they've been considered as cheaters exactly because they do not uh, move seeds much. And they are neglected in frugivory studies. But again, we know more better and better, and we know that pulp feeders they can affect directly and indirectly all these processes of plants. So and also there is some very interesting studies that show how even though they feed sometimes the pulp remain attached on the fruit, they contribute to forest regeneration and connectivity by moving seeds around without ingesting them. So are they really neutral or cheaters or are we just uh, overlooking these type of interactions? And we have the seed eaters that feed primarily on seeds, so because of that are considered predators, predators. and also because of that they consider not uh, very good dispersers. However, again, we know better and better, and we know that even though there is a cost associated with the interaction because they consume some seeds, rodents, for example, that are some of the main seed eaters, they can cache seeds for later consumption because they store more food for periods of scarcity, no? So they can contribute directly to seedling establishment. And also, even though they're considered low quality seed dispersers, they can actually move seeds a very long distance, as this very interesting study of Patrick shows. They, they put a, a, um, tags on the seeds that they could follow the seeds around, and they saw that they, they, agutis, for example, in Panama, can move seeds up to 208 meters, comparing this, this service uh, the same as the megafauna did before. And one more example with uh, some of a Macau species showing that they can indeed move seeds very far away. And they consume some, as is shown here, but they also drop some intact. And this is very important for plant communities. So are they really antagonists? So what I did was to try to understand what are the sources of effects of frugivores on plants. And instead of just looking them at, as frugivores, but that's is looking at them as fruitvar guilds and all the effects that they can have in multiple effects. And I'm going to go back to this slide after I show my results. And I work with palms, uh, something that I've been working since, uh, my, since my undergrad studies. And this is a very nice group of plants because it's really, it's really diverse, it has around 2,700 species worldwide. They very important, uh, sorry, they have very important um, elements of uh, tropical and subtropical ecosystems. And they have a large variation of traits. So you see that there are multiple types of fruits and fruit size as well. And because they have very large fruits, they are very dependent on frugivores. So it's a very good group, study model group, to work on frugivory. And I work in, in the Americas, I look at the uh, at these interactions in the Americas. And another important uh, aspect that I would like to mention here is that palms, they provide key ecosystem services for us, for human communities. So we, we, we really use palms in many, many different ways. 
and we have some nice compilation also of the benefits uh, that 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 uh, how we use palms for medicine and housing, also cultural aspects. So it's a very interesting group. And one more argument for 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 why palms are important is that they are very one of the most abundant species in some of the main important most important biomes like the Amazon. Okay, so what I did was I just I, I read all the literature available on palm frugivore interactions, so interactions between frugivores and palms, and uh, I could extract uh, uh, quite some interaction records showing how important uh, this group is for, for animals. So we see here that there is almost 500 frugivore species that feed on, on, on 167 palms. So it's really a very important group. And f very briefly about the methods, I just, uh, what I did, I extracted out information about the outcome of the interaction. Does the interaction result in more seeds dispersed or more seeds predated? seedlings emerging, emerge after consumption of the fruits and many other aspects of the interactions to then understand if the interaction resulted in a positive outcome, negative outcome, or dual outcome, which I won't mention anymore. So I will focus on positive and negative. And instead of just looking at one interaction and classifying that interaction as mutualistic or antagonistic, I aggregated outcomes to understand what is the net outcome of one frugivore species on, on, on palms. So that's what you're going to see in my next graphs. You see the proportion of positive outcomes, so it's a continuum. If it has less than 50% of positive outcomes, we consider it uh, mostly antagonistic. And if it, the majority of events result in positive outcomes then they mostly mutualistic. So we're gonna see this continuum with the proportion of positive outcomes, okay? So just to, you, because you probably saw uh, networks or uh, some you do, uh, Paulo Guimarães, he probably supposed that he talked about this. I wanted to show also the network here. And with all the, this, this is another, there in the other slide was 167 because I updated the, the record, sorry, it's not uh, matching. But uh, so with all these palms and uh, lots of uh, many bird species followed by mammals, fish and, and reptiles. And one crab species that was recorded to interact with palm but I didn't include it here. So we he you see here that there is a very, many interactions, some, in some species seem to be uh, forming here model, modules uh, of interactions, but I won't get much in detail on that. What I want to talk about is that uh, when I try to, when I, I look at from those almost uh, 4,000 interactions, only for 1,043 interactions I could really identify which type of interaction was observed, if it was free eating, pulp eating, or seed eating. So what we know is that there is a prevalence of free eating most animals, they, inter they, they, they consume entire fruits. But for mammals, for example, seeds are also very important. So there is a lot of records of seed eating interactions. And then I was interested in looking for the neotropical frugivores, neotropical animals in the Americas, how they, what are the roles they play for, for palms. And here you can have the, we, we, I show the full graph, but I'm gonna just, show each part separately. But what I want to emphasize here is that when we look at this proportion of positive outcomes and where the animals are ranked, we see that uh, most of them are somewhere in between. So even though we classify them in, as antagonists or mutualists, both, all of them, most of them, they have some positive uh, impact on plants and some <coughs> What I do, should I look at the other now? <laughs> For a change, okay. <laughs> so then we have, uh, we can see here that there are some fully mutualists. I wanna go into, much de into more detail in the next slides. Okay, so here I'm showing, I think, uh, yeah. 
we can see here, here we have families of frugivores instead of species. So I, we, we see here that there are many families, uh, families of the toucans and other birds, large birds from canidae or opossums and many species that are important for palms. And we see that most of them, most of the species, they benefit palms somehow. No? So this is, they are the blue ones, the mutualistic ones. What is interesting as well is that uh, when, we, when I, this, this result shows that uh, some families that are known for being very antagonistic, they actually mostly mutualistic, for like the, the rodents, uh, agoutis and acushis and the parrots. But some families are indeed mainly uh, antagonistic and those are mainly seed eaters like peccaries, squirrels, deers, spine rats. And uh, some families, they are really, really uh, highly mutualistic. And those are, some of them are known for us already in frugivory studies, like this, these large birds, toucans. But some, we do not, we overlook their role on, on, on for seed dispersal and plant communities in general, like opossums or even those carnivores that benefit seeds. When we look at the, the species here is not family, it's the species, sorry. When you look at the, the, these different species, I'm not sure how familiar as you are with all these names, but uh, you can see by the, by the silhouettes here. So we see again that most of them have some benefits for plants, right? They are here in blue, scoring high on positive outcomes. And again, those fully mutualistic are large birds and uh, some, some mammals. And again, mainly fruit eaters. But some of animals that we consider legitimate dispersers, like uh, uh, tapirs, they indeed mutualistic. But we can see here that they also they do not score on 100% positive outcomes because some interactions also result in antagonisms. And this is what I wanted to emphasize. And uh, non species is fully antagonistic, even those species that break seeds and have a negative impact on plants, for depending on the context, on the plant trait as well, they can also promote some benefits. So this is important to incorporate when we think of the effects of frugivores on plant communities. So, and okay, so what are the sources of intraspecific variation? And I just said, uh, what, uh, one main clue for understanding also is the matching, you know, how, what are the fruit traits and how these interactions can result can in, 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 in different outcomes. So here I, f I have got for these three species, one species of uh, agouti, one macaw, and for the lowland tapir, because we have ma plenty of studies on it, I could have, um, I could look at what is what determines this variation? Because we can see here that for the tapir, you can have very little benefits for the plant, but it can also be very mutualistic, and the same for the others. So what we see is that, uh, and this is what I'm, I'm continuing doing my research to understand, because the palm traits, the palm fruits they eat, they feed on uh, multiple palms, and they have different traits. So for some of them, they like this interaction between agouti and eutepidulis, you have no benefit at all. And because that's because the agouti is scoring here. But for some of them, you have almost 70% almost of the plants, of the seeds benefit because they're cached and then they are, they germinate and they establish. And the same we see for the Macau, we have uh, for those that have more pulp, they do not damage the seeds. But those they feed that there is no pulp, they feed mainly on the seeds. So there is this multiple effect that animals can have on plants. Again, the same for the tapir. What is even more interesting here is that for the same plant species, as you can see, they can have different effects. So it depends on the context as well, and we need to incorporate this variation. So. This, is, uh, this work was also published as a review, so I talk about each one of those uh, effects that uh, different guilds can have on multiple effects of offense. And it's pretty much what I've been talking about. It's just like how they feed on the fruits, 
where they, if they, they, if the seed goes through the entire gut or if it's regurgitate, and if, whether the animals catch fruits or not, and all these have important impacts there. So this perspective of looking at in the, of the interactions as a continuum, this could be for any, of, any interaction, basically. It's important because instead of classifying uh, in, in antagonism or mutualisms, we can quantify the net interaction outcomes. And this helps us to, to understand better the system and to avoid misrepresentation of ecological roles. And we account for variation, that I couldn't insist more how important is variation instead of just trying to place things in boxes. And what's the relevance of it? And well, this has multiple relevances, including for understanding ecosystem functions, for, for example, and I'm, I will get there. So first, uh, I want to, to say that free eaters are not fully mutualistic, as is understood in the literature, and pulp eaters are also not neutral because they can affect seeds in multiple ways, and seed eaters can also act as mutualists. And this type of differentiation is important for many aspects in science. One example, because we work there in the lab with networks, we have, this, these papers were published, it's not from our group, but I just wanted to show examples of uh, incorporating the type of interaction in network instead of just uh, considering the same type as, so in looking at, at interaction networks, uh, uh, incorporating variation of outcomes, it's shown that to increase, for example, to, ch to affect how we look at the nestedness or connectance patterns and also community stability. So it's very important that we give this step into incorporating variation of outcomes. And this, uh, this differentiation is also important when we consider that, uh, when, because we know that long, dis long distance dispersal events is very important for plants, for colonizing new areas and how we see the potential for dispersal distance in different guilds is important for us to predict how far those seeds can be moved. And this is important because we know that uh, how the loss of the megafauna, for example, led to the shortening of seed dispersal. This is a very interesting paper from Matias, Paulo, um, Mauro in, in Pedro, where they show how the, the contemporary animals, the animals that uh, are large and that we still have, how they can, they move seeds much, uh, at much, much smaller distance than the, the, the megafauna did before. And this is important because what we doing more and more is to try to understand the effects of climate change on plant distribution. So although, even though we often consider relationships according to only which animals can ingest entire fruits. We also need to account that there is, there is a source of, of movement that comes from animals that do not ingest the entire fruits. They can, as I've shown in, in other slides, they can move seeds very far away. And I also show here, actually. So we here have some examples of uh, animals, large animals that carry seeds on their beaks, for example and uh, how they are overlooked. And again, the, that example of the agouti. And also we have uh, some fruit eaters that are overlooked, like fish, because they move seeds at extremely long distances. But uh, this is not also taken into account and important. It's important. So ectozochory, it emerges as a main mechanism for dispersal of less seeded plants. And I also found uh, this for, for the system with palms, where we see that uh, some pulp eaters, like this macaw here, can move seeds up to 1,000 uh, meters distance from the, so from the source. Okay, and what is the, again, for the, what's the impact of this continuum for, for uh, ecosystem functions like carbon storage, storage or nutrient cycling? We know uh, already that uh, defaunation, the loss of animals in forests can affect carbon storage because animals, the large animals, they consume seeds that are larger and that are often associated that there is a positive relationship with carbon storage capacity. So 
when we lose uh, the large animals, we are also losing those trees that uh, store lots of carbon. But this interaction is, is, this is considered mainly because there is this, this trait matching rule based on size where only the large, very large animals can ingest the entire, entire fruits. But when we look, when we consider ectozoochery, this dispersal by, uh, without ingesting the entire fruits, we see that, uh, here is another paper that I've, I, I worked with these colleagues, Pedro Poliana and Alexandra. She was my, uh, the, 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 my supervisor in my master studies, and then we were collaborating again. And we see here that uh, agoutis, for example, even though they, they do not ingest the entire fruits, they can disperse seeds with, uh, with high carbon storage and even larger than those that are dispersed by tapirs or, or large primates, for example. So it's very important that we consider other types of frugivory interactions uh, and the effects on, on ecosystem dynamics. And finally, just to connect a bit also with what I've, I'm doing now, we, this, this, when, we, when we, instead of just thinking about animals that feed on fruits and uh, they, and considering only the, the, the legitimate dispersers, the ones that ingest the entire fruit, when we consider the others as potential for uh, mutualistic selection, selection as well, we start uh, looking at coevolutionary dynamics in other ways. We integrate uh, multiple, uh, often conflicting selective pressures that uh, these animals uh, do on, exert on, on, on palm trees. And so what I'm doing as well is trying to understand what are the traits that are selected by each one of these guilds and how they, the, the traits of these plants may have evolved in response to different selection by different guilds, and also how this variation here affects this coevolutionary dynamics. And I think that's it. I just um, wanted to conclude uh, once again how those they impact the different uh, demographic uh, plant demographic process and the mechanisms differ among guilds, and. How, this how important this variation is for shaping complex dynamics and ecological communities. And it makes it a lot more difficult to study and to work with as well, but it's very important to, that we incorporate this interspecific and intraspecific variation to understand the dynamics of these mutualisms and antagonisms. And uh, the variation is the norm, so we need to look at this as well. And that's it, guys. Thank you so much. Thank you also, everyone that uh, invited us here. <laughs> and questions? Thank you. What time is it? You have questions? No? Uh, probably uh, the question comes because I um, am not from ecology nor biology. So, okay. uh, I didn't understand very well uh, the nature of the data uh, of of the articles you. So how how is it collected to see? Because uh, for me it seems quite hard to think like oh oh it's just gotten a seed. What will we do with it? Oh, it's gotten the seed got there and now it's grown. So I don't know how okay. the, this data is. Well, there are lots of different uh, methods that are used in studies, no? So is, is it exactly your question, like how do we quantify this or how I quantify the outcomes? Uh, so uh, how do the original articles collect such data mostly? Oh, okay. And also how you can uh, join all this data into one coherent uh, data, uh, one coherent measure of yours based on those ver very, okay. very... Uh, so, so this is a review, it's not a meta-analysis or something. I didn't uh, extract all the statistics that were in the papers. And uh, I just, uh, in the paper published, I have, uh, I just forgot to put it here, but I have uh, uh, like a toolbox for each guild, how can we assess each one of uh, effects in each 
uh, demographic process of plants, but basically people people measure different things, and that's also why it's it was important to put all results in one place because uh, it's very challenging to look at uh, how frugivores impact seeds. And often what uh, researchers do, they look at one, the effect of, for example, on seed viability. So they can collect seeds from animal feces and then they check for seed viability with different tests. Or they can, um, or like I did, I searched for uh, seeds distributed on the ground floor it's pretty hard, it's like catarcoquinho, né? catarcoquinho is not simple, so it is tough. And then you look at the uh, or marks of animals to identify which animals uh, feed, f were feeding on the fruits and what is the impact. Or you can look at, um, for example, there are some birds, umbrella birds, that they use a kind of uh, mating system in which they do legs on the floor, they clean all around, and then uh, researchers, they, because those animals were always coming back to the same spot, researchers could check that seedling establishment of one palm was higher in these areas, so they can, they can conclude that there is a positive effect because they, they look at different aspects of these interactions. And then what I did for each one of those interactions, I would uh, if the information on the outcome was quantitative, 30% uh, of, of the seeds survived the interaction, 70 not, I would compile this information and classify it as, in this case, 30% survived, I would classify it as mostly negative. If it's qualitati qualitative, uh, because the authors confirm somehow that uh, it's a positive or negative interaction, I would compile this information. In the end, I would have for the same frugivore species multiple entries with um, positive or negative interactions. Then I aggregate it and I see the, the proportion. Is it, uh, is it a bit clearer it's much, now? It's much clearer okay. now. Uh, I, I forgot to, to mention, thank you for the talk, by the way. Uh, uh, very aesthetically you. pleasing also. So oh, you. nice. And uh, uh, this, the, the data set is all the information I compiled is available and uh, we put it on open access. So it's also very cool to, to play around and to see effects of some animals, specific animals on, on a specific palm gen, gen, genus if you work with these or something like that. It's all available, it's open access. <laughs> Okay, hello. Well, nice. thank you for the lecture, really amazing. Nice. Uh, I would like to know a little bit more about the, the data set also. Uh, th there was how uh, equitatively distributed were the, I imagine that there is a tendency. So do you remember from the top of your head which genera that were more uh, common to appear in the data set? The, for the, for the, the animals? For the plants. For the plants? Um, you you know like uh, plant uh, lots of okay yes. I can okay cool uh, Atalea, Euterpe, Astrocarium. It is in Brazil because most of studies in frugivory are also found in Brazil. But uh, also for if we go upwards, if we more to uh, do we have um, lots of Sabau species okay. as well, but. Uh, Copernicia, um, not many genome, I don't know, many, it's 54 genera, I think, of palms that in are included neotropics? in the data set. Okay. No, in the, in the data set. Not uh, complete, we don't have information, no. Uh, the, the total number of species was <laughs> 170 more or less palm species and we have 550 in the Americas. Okay. So for most species we still don't even know which animals feed. And something that I'm also interested in doing is looking, using what I know already from these interactions and do, doing some machine learning methods to try to infer uh, based on the traits of plants mm -hmm. which animals probably feed on the fruits. 
So we can do this kind of work yes. from this. Or everyone can do that as well, because it's all available. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. No more questions? All right. And if you change your mind, you can also ask later on. But I will give space to Erica now. It's okay? Thank you, guys.
Alô? Será que eu bato mais pra cima? Hi. Well, this is strange. I use it to speak aloud, so it will be so aloud. <laughs> Hi. My name is Erica, and I'm postdoc at Professor Paulo Guimarães Lab. And you can find me in my, my Twitter, in my, uh, by my mail. And today, I will talk with you. I'll speak a little bit about a different kind of uh, ecological interaction that that ones that occur between individuals and the roadmap of this presentation is this one first i will try to convince you why it's cool to look at social interactions and how they are structured as also what's important what's impo its importance for ecological community via interspecific interactions. And at the end, I will let you some take home messages. Well, when you look at an uh, environment and, and we see all of these species, we can infer, as you have been seeing in this, these last weeks, different kinds of interactions as predation, mutualisms, um, com competition. But indeed, all of this, these interactions, we, we use it to look as in the species level, in, in the special level, but these interactions are, are being doing between individuals. One individual, each one, another one, or compete with another one. And also, these individuals interact inside the same species, and not in a homogeneous way as we, we have to look and think when we um, study ecological communities. They interact in a heterogeneous way inside this, in the same uh, species. And, well, first I'll try to convince you that social interactions pre, interactions pre and after maturations affect individuals' reproductive investment that we already know for that one, the, you guys that are not biology, it's really important for the fitness and the success of the individuals, How, for the children, babies. But, well, elephants spend so much time to grow up and to have kids, and kids 
spend so uh, spend so much time to to have their own babies. So I will talk about this question. I will answer this question. Show you a different uh, species, a more acutest species than elephants. That is the Australian backfield cricket, Telegrill commodus. As as you already know, that Flavia said, um, I was I did my PhD with Glauco Machado, that you already know, with sexual selection. And in my, one of my, my one, one part of my postdoc, oh, my postdoc, my PhD was to answer this question with these individuals and see a lot of cricket porn <laughs> during a lot of days. And here, just to you know, we have two, two individuals. Uh, here is a female up, female it's up. And here is the male, just to, to point. Well, this is the results uh, of this paper published in, oh, I forgot the year. OK, in 2020. And I'll try to explain you quickly this. The important things you have to know that females like males by their calls. And males can call in a high attractively, attract, attractive, sorry, attractive way, here in red or more or less, or no, it's a terrible call. And we raised it, these females in two kinds of environments, and they listen until, uh, since they are, they are juveniles, until they are adult, adult life. In one environment, only at highly attractive calls, and in another environment, only uh, two types of calls. When they are uh, adult, we made, let them mate with a, lo a lot of males, and we have a proxy of the attractiveness of these males by their own calls. And then they had children, and we could uh, measure the quality of these children by their mass. And my question is, do the, the, this uh, social environment that we uh, emulated for them are important and interact with the mating partners they found as adults to define how much these females are investing on offspring? Well, yes. The investment in offspring dependent on the interaction between social environment, this two, and the mates. So females invest more in offspring when they um, mate with highly attractive males, but only when they are raised in an environment which with a variation of male calls. The same does not occur. This, this, this uh, blue line don't have effect, only the orange one. So at this point, I hope you are convinced that social environment is important. And then social environment can act as important driver of the expression of individual traits and consequently of the intra and interspecific interactions of these individuals. Well, but how to quantify social interactions? How you measure them? How you look at these uh, interactions? With networks, you know networks already. And here, the idea is that the nodes or vertices, vertices, but it's, uh, are the individuals, and edges or links are the social relationships between these individuals. And here, it's an empirical network with groups of elephants. And you can see that different um, thickness of the lines represents how much they interact between each other. The colors represent the main groups that keep together more time. And here, just to, know, uh, just to highlight different uh, connectiveness between two kinds of groups. OK, but what factors we already know that, uh, that uh, determine this kind of social interactions? Well, depend on individual traits. Social networks in structure differ from what we would expect under random interactions between the individuals in space and time. Uh, we can find patterns uh, depending, that depend on physical and behavior, individual car characteristics, as sex, size, lineage, as also aggressiveness, boldness, tolerance, cooperative behavior. And they have different kinds of uh, links in these networks. One kind is interactions, are, sorry, is 
interactions like grooming, fighting and mating are social associations that represent like uh, that are based on how much time these individuals are interacting. How frequent is this interaction? And you also based on all this variation we find a lot of different kinds of uh, social networks. Here we have a giraffe social network in which females are blue, males are um, light blue, green, no, no. And uh, you can see how different the, uh, and the, the size of the node represents how much they are connected with other individuals. And you can see how much important is this differentiation to the composition of this network, network for the structure of this network. Here you have um, a network about, uh, with individuals from um, Jesus Macaques, no? And uh, males are squares, females are um, circles, and males, uh, uh, squares like um, dark blue, are the most dominant males, and they are here in the middle of the network. We also have uh, different uh, networks like these ones, super mixed with goopies and um, or that one, that ones uh, of networks of um, killer whales that you can see the groups and the size of the node that represent the importance of each of the individuals in this whole network. They, as you noted, they vary in space and time from structures based on groups that are stable of, over multiple generations as these uh, killer whales, the elephants that I showed you before, to those based on groups that split and merge and sub submit in time scale. That's the case of this network here. And an important point, all these individuals here are females, for example, for this species. Females are the most, most important uh, individuals to um, maintain the network and uh, also to maintain the structure a long time, uh, in a long generations. Uh, in this study, study they looked uh, for data uh, accumulated from several years, some decades, and they could uh, evaluate how much important is the poaching by hunters Oh, uh, uh, because hunters use it to kill the, mo the bigger elephants. And they are also fema some frequently females and the most important uh, individuals for the structure of the network. But uh, mothers define these arenas for their daughters because when poaches, poaching remove one of the mothers, the daughter maintains the structure of the network in the, in the, last, um, in, in, in the time. So these networks are so um, permanent. Here you can see, for example, two groups that med merged before, after um, a mom be killed. Okay, and how to collect data about social, uh, uh, animal social networks? We put cameras, you know, follow the animals on, on the space. Uh, there are some kind of ways to look at this data. And here, it's, uh, th this, this, this paper is really nice, th these images from this paper. And he shows different forms of, con of uh, measure the connections between individuals, as also methods for data collection, and uh, interactions between them to, to show it. A lot of students, empirical students, that already did this kind of uh, evaluation. So here, you can use, for example, sharing a specific location, how, how much these individuals share this, put a little bit, uh, this, some locations, uh, group memberships, partial proximity, behavioral interaction. Um, they can uh, use uh, tags, observational, um, uh, keep observing, keep recording, and uh, um, you can also do experiments like with birds inside big cages and uh, note how much pairs maintain together to, to eat something. And here, th in this information can be discrete, 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 sorry, or continuous in space and time. Okay? Okay, but 
we are in a, in a part of this, this, this course talking about communities. And how can social networks affect these uh, inter, uh, interspecific interactions that are important for communities' composition and maintenance? maintenance? Well, I will show you some exam two examples, and this is the first one. Here we have uh, 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 this study um, analyzed uh, these three species that are sympatric from the same family, and they forage, to, forage together and share information about food availability on the environment. And they, they are interested in inter understand if do the position in social network affect the foraging behavior or the for, foraging ability in, the, in this group of species? Well, they could identify the individuals, uh, they could measure the time they spent together because they used uh, this kind of uh, sunflower feeders that's it. The, uh, with cameras and they could identify who found food patches in between these individuals, how many patches are found by each one. This is the resulted network composed by individuals from three species and in gray no, gray nodes are that ones that never found for the first time alone a uh, food patch. The, and these biggest ones, like this with, this with four, four th this individual find food patches four times for the first time. So here they concluded that as much connected with other individuals these individuals are, most, uh, the probability to find food and to use that food resource was higher. Central individuals are more likely to locate and use novel, novel foraging patches. None of other traits measured as sex and age, explaining the variation in patch discovery probability or in the number of patches found by these individuals. And similar conclusions were found from suitable disease spread. When we are looking at this uh, study, they are sharing um, information. But in studies about the spread of diseases, what the thing that individuals share, it's disease, it's infectiveness. So the same pattern that we found in studies about the spread of information, it's, it's the pattern found to studies in disease spreads. Uh, recently, Finn and collaborators look at this data again. This data is uh, available. And they could uh, look at this data in a different form. They are comparing the interactions inside each of these species and also the interactions between each of these species, considering by par by par interactions between individuals. And what they, they noted is that Interspecific associations uh, are, are more important for acquiring information than interspecific uh, associations. And also, we have individuals that, that are more connected with interspecific individuals than other ones in the same population. And this kind of analysis is recent, is nowadays like improving and becoming more common. And People are trying to develop methods to use this kind of analysis. Um, it's, the name is multi-layer networks, multi networks, and this is um, an empirical uh, example of a multi-layer network in which you have one layer that is a species, another layer that's another species, and interaction between the layers. In this case, this old study, study not so old, but yeah, it's old. Uh, it's a study that, that shows an a inherent multi-layer network structure. Well, the second example that I will show you to convince you that social networks and social inter interactions are important is this one with this cute guy here. This is a, a, an individual from European badgers. They are a reservoir of Mycobacterium bovis, that the causative agent, agent it, the causative, causative agent of bovine tuberculosis. So it's a disease that's important for uh, 
economical stuff. <laughs> and the idea here is to answer, are sex biases, biases in infection? And these ones are related to, to the variation, multi-layer contact structured by sex in a naturally infected population. What the hell? I will explain. Um, yeah, this guy, this, this, uh, sorry, first, spoiler, these um, researchers could uh, identify a, a lot of individuals by marking, and when they mark, they could test if they are infected with this disease. So they have the uh, sex of each individual, the, uh, how much they are, uh, dispersing on space because they use radio colors, you know, telemetry. And also how much time they spend together, male, 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 female, 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 or male in females. They could measure this, the time and the proximity of these this, uh, connections between individuals. So they have uh, how many are infect infected, which ones are infected, and if they become more time together, no. What they found, it's that this structure, they could perceive that some individuals maintain, uh, stay together more time than other ones, so they could identify some groups. And here, it's a multi-layer that they found. Here we have only males, here only females, and the connections between the sexes. Not mating, just connection, they, they do not uh, measure if they mate or not, but how much time they stay together. But Indeed, it exists, social, uh, sexual networks also is not the case here, but it exists. And, um, uh, yeah, the black lines are the contacts between the same sex, gray lines between sexes, and no, no color indicates the social groups that uh, the researchers attributed for these individuals based on how many they are interacting between themselves in this population. Uh, okay, and what they found, they could identify how kind of individuals are more important for the disease spread. So male-male and between sex contacts occur at a broader spatial scale than female-female. Male-male and between sex contacts are more important in connecting the population and forming wider social networks and they, then they concluded that the contacts involving males play a more important role in the spatial spread of infection. And why this is important? It's because the knowledge that males tend to occupy more important roles in, in a badger contact network could facilitate the targeting of man management interventions. For example, vaccination of some parts of individuals. Uh, we, no, we never have a lot of money in science. And you need to decide which kind of individuals you should vaccinate or give medicines or even, you know, poach, in the, as in the case of the elephants. And um, now we know which ones we should target with in this management. And, uh, in, uh, and, and that's it. Well, this, just to, this is the last part of this presentation. Again, this is a... Um, a theoretical figure about how we can look at uh, uh, different connections between individuals and the importance of these connections with the environment in a multi-layer network approach. And here you can see, for example, that different individuals, the same species, interact differently with the environment and different with other individuals of other species that also inter interact different in a in variable way inside the same species. And all of this could uh, affect and will affect the way that, for example, a disease is spread in, in, in all this environment. And here it, we are talking about only two species because it's so much informa information in each layer and so much a lot of math you know more than, than I, probably. And um, because of this, now people are trying to develop methods to analyze this kind of complexity of the, in the data. Well, after all this blah, what are the tech home measures, me messages I would you take with you today? Social interactions are determinants of the information spread as also of the spread of infectious, infectious diseases and pathogens. 
Loss and gain of individuals affect social interactions and social interactions affect, affect interspecific interactions. And social find structure methods on a broader scale than initially expected, affecting many key, key, sorry, many key ecological and evolutionary processes. At least I, I hope because I'm, I'm start, I just started my postdoc in this area, so I hope it's so important. <laughs> And now, um, I want to thank um, Miudo, also known sometimes as Paulo Guimarães Jr. for the opportunity, the university, and Carlos Melian, our collaborator, and this Swiss agency that I'm not capable to say the name, about to, for paying me and paying my postdoc. <laughs> and that's it. And this is the theoretical part I will... I, I'd like to talk with you, but Flavia, remember me because I forgot to put here that I also do work with science outreach about sexual selection because is the I like to talk about sex, and I have a, at the moment I'm I'm working on a, a page on Instagram and I will let the the uh, the at at thank you at here it's like V. It's not about network, it's not about bad, it's just about sex <laughs> and, and animal behavior, but it's really nice. And you can find me online if you want to send me mail or contact me, feel free. And that's it. <laughs> Questions? Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, you say you, you showed the, that the birds that had more connectivity, mm -hmm. they because they had more information, they found more food patches. Mm -hmm. Couldn't be like the opposite, since they are like finding more food. They had more friends. The birds were like, oh, this guy finds a lot of food. I want to be his friend. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The way that we measure this kind of friendship, it's by the connection between these individuals. These this, this scientists, they look at the recorders in, in each of these feeders. So when one individual arrived, another one arrived together, and they eat together. So it's a kind of, I can, we can call them friends, maybe. But uh, the way, the, the, the funny part is they could identify each of them. So it's not the same two individuals or random. They compared between a, a random ar arrival of these individuals. So there are a pattern. Some individuals are frequently the first ones and the more connected with other ones. This is the kind of they, they measure. I don't know if I, if I answer your question. Okay. Thank you. La la la? La la. It's okay. Uh, I do not uh, understand very well what is the difference between the, the normal approach to ecological networks and the multi-layer approach. Because uh, I, I, I always think about those things coming from graph theory uh, and, and for, for, for the, from the mathem purely mathematical point of view, those networks are, there isn't really a qualitative difference between, mm -hmm. uh, so could you, could you uh, expand on that? Really good question. And I'm currently discussing this with Miudo, and I'll call it the Miudo, use it with this. Um, because actually we can analyze the same data, a data just, just putting the categories of the nodes as different categories, and it's okay. We can analyze the same time. I think at the moment, I'm studying this analysis, I'm not really good at math, but you can analyze in the same big matrix the same, just considering put like more than one information, all of this information in the same uh, analysis. Indeed, I reading this uh, paper about badgers, they describe, and I'm studying, some kind of methods I can send you if you want, specifically for analysis of multilayer networks, 
but I still do not know if they really are so different from the traditional network methods that you can only categorize this kind of nodes. I'm, I'm studying at this moment. If I discover, I can show you and I can send you. But the, the nice part, I guess, is that the, the, bird part, the bird study, when other scientists look at the same database with another point of view, they could find more information. Maybe it's more than a, diff uh, more than a different way to analyze, it, to analyze. It's a different way to look at to these interactions. But yeah, that's it. <laughs> okay, so you can find me in this stuff mm -hmm. if you want. <laughs> that's it. <laughs>